recently purchased this book right here, The Great Taking by David Rogers Webb, and uh, read it with some interest. Um, definitely an interesting book. But I'm going to start out with the greatest book that ever existed, the King James Bible. And it says here in Proverbs chapter 22, verse 7, and this verse, well, actually, I should say this book right here lines up perfectly with what the Bible says in print for over 400 years, this King James Bible. It says here, the rich ruleth over the poor, and the borrower is servant to the lender. Now, let me get into this book here. Um, what is it about? Well, let me read to you here the introduction. Here we have uh, page one introduction right there. And it says here, what is this book about? It is about the taking of collateral, all of it. The end game is of this globally synchronous debt accumulation super cycle. This is being executed by long-planned, intelligent design, the audacity and scope of which is difficult for the mind to encompass. Included are all financial assets, all money on deposit at banks, all stocks and bonds, and hence all underlying property of all public corporations, including all inventories, plant and equipment, land, mineral deposits, inventions, and intellectual property. Privately owned personal and real property financed with any amount of debt will be similarly taken, as will these assets of privately owned businesses, which have been financed with debt. If even partially successful, this will be the greatest conquest and subjugation in world history. We are now living within a hybrid war conducted almost entirely by deception, and thus designed to achieve war aims with little energy input. If it is, it is a war of conquest directed not against other nations, but against all of humanity. I would say mankind, or proper word. But this guy goes into this whole thing of his history, his time in the, all the financier type of stuff. And it just, it always boggles my mind. And just say this, the all the terminology and all the little things that these guys have to come up with in the, the stock market and banking and finance and all these other things, the derivatives market and the, you know, this and all the, all the different languages these guys have to come up with. And he made a really good statement in there. And he said, I think his father taught him that he said, once you understand the tradesmen talk, then you can understand what they're saying and you can carry on a good conversation. And that's true. Absolute truth. Um, if you understand the, a lot of the Latin derived terms of the medical establishment, you can basically see that they're actually speaking very simply um, in pretty easy to understand terms, but they're just Latinized. <laughs> All right. Um, you know, you've uh, broken your, you know, they'll say some big Latin word. Oh, you mean my ankle? You know, <laughs> well, yeah, technically, you know, you get into chemistry, you get into banking, you get into a lot of that different, those different fields and you'll see that. Um, and as a preacher, I understand the language and the terminology of the Bible and of higher textual criticism and, you know, end times, you know, theology and eschatology and all that other stuff. I understand that. So I can hear somebody speaking and I can tell very quickly, are they a Mormon? Are they a Catholic? Are they a Jehovah's Witness? Are they whatever? Uh, I can sense that very quick. I can pick up on it. I'm learning about financial type of stuff. Um, it's very detailed and quite frankly, a lot of it is very much unnecessary to me because I'm not in debt. You know why? Because my Bible right here condemns being in debt. Romans chapter 13 says that uh, we're to owe no man anything. Uh, and I take that seriously. And so I have never been in debt since the entire time I've been married. I was in debt early on back as a lost man, back in my teens. I actually, even, I don't know, I was in high school, I actually got into debt, had a truck that I was making payments on, then I got out of high school and I bought a bunch of other vehicles, ended up buying a, a ATV, a Yamaha Banshee, bought that with debt, brand new from a dealership. I've had different times of debt, but uh, since I've been saved, I haven't been in debt once. Um, at first, just through, I didn't have much money, and then uh, since I've gotten married, my wife and I both have made an agreement that we will never have debt. Um, and that includes credit cards. And um, I'm going to give you some financial advice here in a little bit on the whole thing of how to live debt-free. 
I realize that there are very few people to do anymore, which is insanity, but it's part of the plan that he outlines in this book. Um, so just let me let, I'll kind of give a, a brief synopsis of what the plan is. Um, again, I, I can't give a whole big detailed thing. You go back the whole way to some of the early banking practices and whatever, and even in the Bible itself, there are publicans, the, not republicans, but publicans, tax collectors for the Roman Empire. And um, when you're reading the New Testament, you are reading about events that are taking place around Jerusalem and Israel and things, and then into Corinth and Thessalonica and Ephesus and Galatia. And you'll read all these different areas, and it's all Roman-dominated territories. The Roman army, you know, the Iron Legions of Rome have taken over all these different areas, and the Jewish Christians that are there, and then Gentile Christians as well, uh, after Jesus' death, burial, and resurrection, throughout the book of Acts, they start to preach to the Gentile Christians. And they're all traveling around, but they're all subject to the Roman system. And the Roman system, um, they were constantly having problems. If you study Roman uh, military history, they were constantly having problems paying their soldiers um, because the soldiers were professional soldiers. They needed to be paid, and they were paid in gold. All right, why? Because gold, all through the Bible, all through history, recorded history, gold has been money. Gold is wealth. Well, they started coming up with ways, back even in the Roman times, they would come up with ways of saying, well, if we can't give them gold, maybe we'll give them land, or we'll give them slaves, or we'll give them some kind of way as an incentive to stay here and fight. I mean, if you tell me, okay, I want you to take up the sword here and uh, go you know, rushing into battle, and I'm going to have you slashing and cutting and stabbing and, and you're, oh, I get cut myself or something, and I want you to do it all for free, for the glory of Rome or something. No, you're not going to get too many men to do that. Um, maybe some that would be really foolish or something, but um, you need to pay soldiers. But Rome, if they had campaigns go bad or say the barbaric tribes that they were fighting, um, you see that in the first century there, these barbaric northern tribes, and then it went that way for hundreds of years, fighting back and forth with the northern barbarians, of whom my ancestors come from. I'm not Roman. Uh, but those barbaric tribes, they would defeat the Roman soldiers, and they would take gold sometimes. And sometimes, as strategic type of things, the Romans would pay barbarians gold coin, and so there's never that much gold to go around. So early on, people started to figure out we need to come up with another way to pay people other than gold because there's only so much gold. Hmm. And so the philosophers worked on this thing down through the centuries and they started to introduce things like paper gold, a note. And so the thought was there, don't have any gold coins anywhere here. I don't really keep gold coins at, the proper, at my office here. But this is a bar of copper that I made actually myself back many years ago. I had a little uh, electric foundry thing and I melted a bunch of copper wires and created a pure copper bar here. So they say, okay, this copper bar probably weighs maybe one or two pounds or something like that. Well, that's fairly heavy. And copper is not really worth what silver and gold are. So if I wanted to be paid in copper, or if I wanted to, to buy a house or something in copper, well, I'd have to have a horse and, and, you know, this wagon, and I'd have to have, you know, 500 pounds or something, or maybe we'll, we'll say a ton of copper bars on this wagon. Well, wouldn't it be better to say, okay, I'm going to keep that, those copper bars in a place someplace called a bank, and instead of having, here's, I said 500 pounds, we'll say a ton just to make this make more sense. Instead of me saying, okay, I want to buy that house, here's one ton of copper. Here's one piece that you can inspect, and I have the rest of the you know weight back there in my wagon. Instead of doing that, you keep it at a bank, and the bank says, we'll issue a, a piece of paper that says, this piece of paper back is backed by the one ton of copper in our vault. Excuse me. Just to keep this thing simple. To all the people out there that, you know, I'm not trying to insult anybody's intelligence, but there are people of all ages that watch these videos just trying to make this simple. So now you have this uh, dollar bill. I don't have my wallet on me, but um, here, hold on a second. Let me grab something.
Okay. Here we go. Some different currency that's been sent to us here recently. It's over on my pile of letters. So here you have the Bank of England. Okay. This here is symbolizing that there are 20 British pounds at a bank someplace in gold or something tangible physical asset. And here we have 20 in Canadian dollars. I don't have a $20 bill here with American dollars, but I do have a $2 bill. If you've never seen one of those, I had some somebody send some of these. They're neat. My father used to always love to spend these. He'd call these funny money and he'd go to the bank and ask if they had any funny money and then he'd go to places and give them this, you know, to pay for something and they're going, is this American, you know, money? <laughs> and he used to enjoy doing that. But you have paper currency and this paper currency, the, the philosophy behind it is that it's backed up by something physical at the bank, physical wealth, gold and silver, and maybe copper if you really want to make that argument. But this is supposed to represent real money. This is not real money. You see what I'm saying? The real money is too heavy to move around and it's too cumbersome and whatever else. That was the philosophy behind paper money. But then in 1933, FDR, Franklin Delano Roosevelt, and he's funny because he talked about his father, I think it was, couldn't stand FDR. My grandfather couldn't stand FDR. Hated him. Um, so, interesting there. But FDR came out and he said, hey, we're having some problems here with, you know, money and everything and the supplies and too many people. We need liquidity. See, you know, you have to keep money in the banks, you know, so that we can lend out money and things. That's a whole other issue. But too many people have private reserves of gold. So we have to get the gold back in so we can rebuild the economy. Then we'll give the gold back. Promise. You know, cross my heart and hope to die. I should have. We did die. But uh, yeah. And so what happened is then they came out and they said, hey, don't worry. This is good. We just need to take your gold from you in 1933. Historical fact. They took the gold away. 1964, they took the silver away. We had silver dimes, silver quarters, silver half dollars, silver dollars. They took that away. And now it's just zinc and uh, nickel, or uh, not nickel, um, copper clad zinc coins, I think is what they are, your modern day quarters. You can look at the edge of a quarter, modern day one, you can see the little, you know, copper colored line in it. That's the copper core of the modern quarter. And then in 1982, they went from a almost pure copper penny to a zinc penny copper that's copper coated. <laughs> and they took away the metals. You see, they robbed you. And then they said, okay, we took us off the gold standard too, by the way. I think it was Nixon that did that. Um, and so now it's no longer this money is backed up by gold. No, now this money is gold. This money is all you need. And see, here's the funny thing. Can you make copper out of just whatever? No. Copper is copper. It has weight to it. It has a certain, you know, heaviness to it. Can you make this? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Don't try it because they'll get you for counterfeit. But, uh, you know, you don't counterfeit a counterfeit uh, currency here. So... That's what they did. But then you say, that's where it stopped? I know. It uh, continued. You see, they went from paper currency to then saying, how about no currency? How about we digitize the money? Because there is still some little bit of labor in this, so why don't we just get rid of this altogether and we'll just make it digital? And um, <clears throat> instead of you paying for things in cash, I know. Why wait? We can give it to you with credit. And you can pay us back, don't worry. We'll have certain interest rates and things, and of course it'll take you probably three times as long and three times as much money, you know. Or I should not say three times as long, but three times as much money when you get into most interest rate things that you're paying off. About two-thirds of the amount that you're paying is interest, and one-third is the actual principal, depending on the loan there. But we'll get you into this credit thing. And you get more and more debt. So now it's to the point. See, we're at the end game of this thing. 
because the dollar eventually must collapse. All printed currencies always have. There's not one printed currency ever that lasted. I mean, you could actually, if you would go out and you would get a uh, bar of copper like this, this copper bar came from wire that I melted down. But where did the wire come from? You say, well, it's all mined out of the earth. Maybe, maybe not. Maybe they actually found old copper coins and they melted it down. And then they took those copper coins and they melted those down and melted those down and melted those down and made it into wire and I made it into this. You see, it lasts. What about this? Once this goes kaput, it's no good anymore. What do you do with this? Can you melt this down and turn it into the new currency? No. But you can with that. Hmm. Very interesting. But they get people into debt. What's that going to lead to? It's going to lead to a great transfer of wealth. An incredible transfer of wealth. Because now you have people and they say, um, get up in the morning. I need to get a new car. My car has a problem or whatever else. Let's go down to the dealership. The dealership. And let's go in there and let's say, okay, what do you have available? Hey, you look like the kind of guy that should drive a truck. Okay. Yeah, okay. I sounds good. I'll go get a truck that's terrible on gas and everything. And how much is it going to cost me? Well, let's see what you can afford. We'll sign you up. We'll finance you. And uh, I think that you could afford this payment. We'll just kind of stretch it out a little bit there so you can make it cheap and affordable. Well, that sounds good. Okay. I have my new truck now, driving down the road. Kind of like to get some good new clothes here, you know. Um, hmm. I'll go into the store. I'll buy it with my credit card. Oh, and while I'm here, I'll get some new shoes and I'll get a new pair of pants and get some cologne or something, maybe a watch and, and uh, maybe I'll get a hat. And On the way home, oh, I'm a little bit hungry. Let's go into that restaurant there and let's eat something. You go in, I'll pay for that with my credit card. And then you drive back to your house and you say, I'd like to get a different house. Let me go down to the bank and get a mortgage. And pretty soon, everything you own is not really owned by you. Pretty soon, it's all debt. And you don't have any actual, real, physical wealth. I mean, the net worth of people here in America is frightening. And yet you look and you say, America is the richest country in the world. No, it isn't. It's the most in-debt nation in the world. And the illusion that you see out there, people driving their nice new vehicles and living in these big houses, it's all just debt. It's all based on that whole thing. And that's what he's saying that the end goal is here, that they're going to take it all away. If you don't own it, if you don't own it outright, if you're not debt free, this guy here, and I don't know who he is or whatever else, but what he's saying, he knows the language. He knows the lingo of these people. I think he probably used an alias. I don't know for sure um, because you try to find out who the guy is. It's kind of hard to find out, but maybe it's his real, real name. I don't know. But the whole point is what he's warning about is that they're going to take everything away. You say, oh, now, come on. Nobody's saying this. This is nonsense. Oh, uh, what about the Klaus Schwab? You will own nothing and be happy. And you say, well, that's, that won't happen for years out into the future. Friend, I uh, hate to break the news to you, but it already has happened. What are you talking about? Most people don't own, don't own anything. It's all bank financed. You see, you, can own, you cannot really say that you own anything unless you're debt free. Just the way that it is. And I mean, they could try to take private property and everything too here. Don't get me wrong. They could try to confiscate everything, come out with, you know, different ways, raise your property tax way up so that you can't afford it. Or, you know, there's different things that they could try to do, but it's going to be a lot tougher to take away people that are debt free, take away their wealth than it is to take away people that are in debt. Really something, um, you know, and I mean, is it going to happen? Uh, just that way, I mean, how are they going to do this when the dollar defaults or, you know, when the dollar finally crashes, what are they going to do? I don't know, but I know one thing. I'm glad that I follow the scriptures 
And the scriptures say that I'm not to owe any man anything. The scriptures say that the borrower is servant to the lender. Uh, the wicked borroweth and payeth not again, the Bible says. The Bible never speaks well of debt, ever. Uh, God can bless you with being debt free. But um, if you're covetous and you want something right now without having to wait, then you'll go out and you'll get yourself into debt. But I'm going to give you some real financial advice here. I was going to do a whole study on this, but I might as well just get it out right now. Um, and this real financial advice, I don't have to worry one minute about anybody trying to sue me because I gave them the wrong financial advice. I'm going to give it to you straight. And it's perfect, pure. You can count on it 100%. And... Uh, Real financial advice coming up here. Okay, number one, if you can't afford it, don't buy it. Pretty simple, you know. The Bible says, take heed uh, and be, or beware of covetousness, for a man's life abundeth not, or uh, a man's, um, a man's life consisteth not in the abundance of the things which he possess, possesseth. I think is how it goes. Don't have notes on this, but I'm just trying to get through this quick here. Number two, save money and spend less. Save your money to buy the things that you need, okay? And uh, don't spend as much money. Live below your means, right? That's very important. In other words, live a very frugal life. You're never going to go wrong with that. You can't possibly go wrong with that. Number three, if you can't hold it, you don't own it, all right? Assets versus liabilities. It's another thing that's very important. You know whose copper bar this is? It's mine, you know why? Because I'm holding it. I can hold it. It's mine. It has some wealth to it. It's not worth a whole lot right now. Maybe a couple dollars or something like that. Maybe $20 or I don't even know what. Not worth a whole lot, but you know what? It's mine. I can hold it. I own it. Um, another thing that's very important. You put your money into the bank, that money is going to be lent out. That's a whole other part of the thing there. Fractional reserve banking. You can study that. Uh, they don't have your money in the bank. When you put your money in there, you have a number that's in there. There's no box with, you know, $20,000 worth of cash or something or whatever you have in the bank. $500, $100, $20, whatever you have. They take that money and they lend it out. My wife literally has a book, um, uh, American Banking Association or something. I forget what it is. and But it's actually one of their books. A textbook for the banking industry and they literally are talking about lending out a dollar of depositors money literally you put a dollar in the in the bank they will spend it they exchange it on the stock market and they also will lend it out to people now think about that what if there's some bad people in your area you live near a big town or you live in the city or something and there's the bars and the nightclubs and the you know all the other wicked establishments in there and you put all your money in the bank, just keep it all going into the bank. The bank takes it, they have it in there, and the strip club owner comes over and he says, hey, I need to take out a small loan here because I need to you know, hire some new girls and we need to fix the one stage up and put a new pole in or something. And they say, oh, okay, we'll lend out this money. They lend him your money. You have no say over the matter. They don't call you up and say, oh, excuse me, Mr. Denlinger, um, do you mind if we lend some of your money to the guy that owns the nightclub? They aren't going to do that. So why would you put all your money in the bank? You want physical assets, right? Understand that. Again, uh, number four, godliness with contentment is great gain, according to the scriptures. The Bible talks about laying up treasures in heaven where thieves can't break in and steal it, and you know, moths and rust do not corrupt it. Uh, that's very wise, right? Godliness with contentment, again, living a frugal life. What's more important to you? Uh, being very wealthy and having lots of money or knowing the scriptures. The scriptures are far more important. Unfortunately, this guy here makes it very plain that he doesn't believe in the scriptures, which I'll get into in just a minute. Um, again, uh, live below your means. I did a sermon years ago about um, the, the verse of scripture. It talks about there's him that maketh himself poor yet hath great riches. All right. Living below your means is very important. If you make $50,000, act like you make... 20, or spend like you make $20,000 a year, and so on and so forth. Live below your means. Uh, number six, avoid debt at all costs. Do not get in 
to debt. You say, Brother Brian, though, what happens if we have an emergency? What are we supposed to do if we have an emergency? Then we have to get into debt. I had to use a credit card to get myself out of this bad situation. Well, see, what, what you do when you get to be debt free is you actually start to build up physical wealth. So I can take my infamous bar of copper here and I can say, oh, I just had this thing happen. Hmm. I'll go down to the precious metal dealership in my area or coin shop or whatever else or even scrapyard if I had to. And I could take this bar of copper here, hand it to them and say, what do I get for this? Well, that's pure copper. Well, yeah, it's melted wires is what it is. Let me weigh that. Weighs it? No, well, give you $10 for it. Scrapyard here. Well, that paid my bill. Okay. You see? Um, have some cash around. You know, this stuff still works. Thankfully, they're trying to get rid of that, trying to make it all digital, which then will be in a lot of trouble, central bank digital currency. And on that note, let me just say this. Um, that's one thing he warned about in the great taking, the central bank digital currency being kind of the end game thing. But there's two things standing in the way of that. Number one, older people that just aren't going to be able to learn that new technology. Number two, the infrastructure. The infrastructure is not there. You say, well, it's, it's there in my area. Well, that's because you live in the city. Um, they're trying to get it in. I'm seeing the self-checkout lines in local stores here. I'm seeing them trying to get this whole thing in, and you can tap your cell phone to pay for things and whatever else. Uh, fight that stuff. No, I want to pay with cash. That's the best way to slow down the system. But you know, what do you do about Craigslist? What do you do about other things where you're dealing in person with people? I want to buy your snowmobile, or I want to buy your lawn chairs, or something like that, or your lawn mower, or your car. You have to pay with cash. So the infrastructure is not there yet for the whole central bank digital currency thing. They can try to roll it out just as sort of a bank to bank transfer thing and we can just just experimental. We're not trying to force this on anybody with a social credit score or anything like that, uh, but that is their end goal. And if you read again the Bible, the good old King James Bible talks about the mark of the beast with which, uh, without which uh, no one can buy or sell in the future. So, but do you avoid debt? You build up physical wealth. You have some extra cash aside. You have some other things that you can sell if you have to, to pay for bills. Um, and of course, you can keep some money in the bank. I'm not saying just no bank account or anything else. That makes life pretty hard and whatever, but don't keep a whole lot of money in the banks. Um, I'm actually hearing right now, uh, today, the 4th, I think, of November, they're actually starting to have some problems with deposits going through at banks because the banks are starting to become insolvent. Because again, the banks have to continue to have money coming in from people and have money going out. You know, um, I th what is it called? Uh, um, he has it in the book there, Velocity of Money or something, I think it's called. And it just means that money, as it comes in, they have to lend it out. And then that money has to be lent out and then lent out and lent out and lent out. It's, it's all just a huge big scam when you get right down to it. But... Um, as I stipulated earlier, number seven here in my little booklet, lay up treasure in heaven. Um, doing things for the Lord, reading his word, praying, uh, giving to ministries, giving to you know charitable things that are really good for charity. Um, those are good things to do. So, um, but just to get back to the book here, this great taking, um, going through it and definitely making some good points. I learned a good amount of things from this book. Um, but now we have a problem. Page 67, the conclusion. What is the conclusion? What is the end of this matter? Um, Tyndale Bible 1526. Let every soul submit himself unto the authority of the higher powers. There is no power but of God. The powers that be are ordained of God. I didn't get a chance to check that with my actual Tyndale Bible, but um, it's Romans chapter 13, verse 1. I think it is. Um, just flip there real quick. I think it's verse 1. Um, <clears throat> but he quotes from William Tyndale here, and then he says a little sarcastic thing about Tyndale. Uh, Romans chapter 13 and verse 1. Yeah, the King James Bible says, Let every soul be subject unto the higher powers, for there is no power but of God. The powers that be are ordained of God. Um, and then he writes in here in his book, for his efforts in translating certain texts into the English of the day. Certain texts? Uh, no, the Bible. The Bible is what he translated. Because the Bible back then is what did.
dethroned all the power of the Roman system through the Catholic Church. Certain texts. Uh, William Tyndale was jailed in a castle just outside of Brussels and then executed by strangulation, after which his body was burned at the stake. Perhaps one might at some point come to question whether the powers that be are ordained of God. One can easily know that they conduct wars against innocent people. All right. Um, they are ordained of God. The Bible is exactly correct. William Tyndale didn't just, you know, make that up and I just kind of will write that. Uh, the, the guy that wrote this book, um, obviously an atheist, and he doesn't quite understand certain things. He doesn't see the bigger picture because they hide from God, because God judges sin. So, you know, I'm going to do the right thing by trying to wake up people and I can tell the truth and blow the whistle and whatever else. And therefore, if there is a God and if there is a judgment day, then I'll look pretty good on that at that time because I, I tried to warn people I did the right thing. I was a good person. Oh, you mean you're self-righteous? Exactly that. Um, no. The powers that be are ordained of God. All right. God will punish a wicked nation, a nation that turns against his word. And it's kind of an interesting thing because if you understand the Bible version issue, the, the you know, textual criticism issue, this King James Bible was translated in 1604 to 1611, seven years to create the best translation ever. It went through a few revisions, just updating spelling, updating the font and whatever. And 1769 is basically what you have in your, in your, you know, off the store shelf King James Bible of today. It's no different than the 1611 in terms of doctrine or anything else. Um, some of the words, like I said, were uh, changed a little bit, you know, some of the word order and, and things, but it's still, it's the same Bible. Okay. Um, spelling changes is mostly what happened there. Um, but this Bible is the greatest book that ever showed up. But then in the late 1800s, they started to, you know, rationalism came into the German schools and, and then it came into England and then they had the whole Brook, False Westcott and Fenton John Anthony Hort, two lost professors, one at Cambridge, one at Oxford in England. They came out with their revised version, which was supposed to be a revision of the King James Bible. It wasn't. It was a whole new version based on the Roman Catholic minority text, a big, huge study. But every time these new versions come out, more bad things start to happen. So in the early 1900s, these new versions are coming out. Late 1800s, England brought out the revised version. Early 1900s, 1901 specifically, America came out with the American Standard Version. All these new versions that go back to the Catholic uh, texts, the Catholic manuscripts, but then they come out as uh, <clears throat> Protestant Bibles. Couldn't be further from the truth. So a lot of this wickedness and evil came because God said, you're rejecting my word. Why would you reject this beloved book that I had so perfectly translated for you? You're rejecting my word. Why would you do that? Okay, I have to punish you. And then people see the punishment and they say, oh, there must not be a God. <laughs> no, he has to punish. A just God will punish. See somebody pulled over beside the side of the road and there's police, you know, behind them and things, lights going and they probably were disobeying the law. Speeding or they have a taillight out or some other type of thing like that. They can't just have law enforcement and they can't punish people. It doesn't work. I know it's being tried in some cities right now, but it doesn't work that way. But, you know, you get into the, the later part of this whole thing here and, and he's talking about, you know, that, that, uh, it's the same thing that some of these other people come out with and they say, you know, we need to focus our energies on coming together and uniting against a common enemy. You know, yeah, the Antichrist movement, in other words. And, you know, we need to wake up people and we need to, you know, not be dogmatic with our religious beliefs and you know, the, all the stuff that the New Age people always bring out. Um, is he right in what he's saying as far as the great taking? Are they going to destroy people that are in debt? Yes, I believe he's right in that. Does that mean that we should all join together and put aside our differences and whatever to fight the common evil? No, it doesn't. It doesn't mean that for one bit. Um, what should you do? Well, what you should do is you should get out of debt. Not because an investment guy says so, but because the Word of God says so. The Bible speaks against debt. That should be your standard. Um, do what you can. 
I know a lot of people have fallen for this trap. I've preached against debt for many years. Uh, we have lived debt-free. I've tried to show how to live debt-free. Um, it's not easy, uh, but once you get through that first couple of years and, and things and you have to live pretty poor life, you'll start to see that your wealth will increase. And I'm not, certainly I'm not a, you know, multi-million dollar ministry or something making huge amounts of money. I'm not. But as we have grown and over the years and, and we have more money coming in, um, the Lord has prospered us quite a bit. And uh, I'm still, still not rich. Please understand what I'm saying. But what I'm saying here is you can live debt free. And I see people and they tell me, oh, Brother Brian, you don't understand. We have to both work outside of the home, the husband and the wife. You don't understand. Uh, I think I do understand. Um, if you're not willing to suffer a little bit as a Christian to live according to the pages of Scripture, well, that's a problem. And if you, you know, the Bible talks about he that is surety of, you know, for a stranger shall smart for it. Um, you're going to be smarting, in other words, hurting for what's about to happen. If this is true here, uh, the great taking, uh, is it going to happen that way? I don't know. Um, and if it does, oh boy. <laughs> and the, but one thing I will say, a question that I would have for this guy here, David Rogers Webb, is I would say, okay, I'm not an economist. I'm not an expert with the economy. Uh, my area of influence is the scriptures. I'm a Bible believing preacher, but Understanding what little I do about economics, one of the primary motivational factors when it comes to men that are financiers, bankers, whatever, is return on investment. So my question to Mr. Webb out there, I don't think he's watching, but if he would or somebody could pass this on to him, my question would be, very simply, um, not if they're going to do the great taking, but let me ask the question, why would they do the great taking? And how would they redeem their money? Uh, the financiers, the top level, the 1%, whatever you want to call them, okay, they take everything. And then what? Um, precious metals, the reason that precious metals aren't really popular among very wealthy people is because you can't really make money on them. The only way that you quote unquote make money is if your currency is devalued uh, through inflation. But if interest rates are going up, the precious metals uh, can be manipulated and whatever else that they aren't really gaining much. So you spend $2,000 on a one ounce gold coin, it's going to be worth $2,000 in the future unless things really happen with the currency. Um, again, the value of gold's pretty much been very similar throughout time if you adjust other key factors. You know, they say a, a, one, a one ounce gold coin could have bought you a finely made um, toga back in the first century if you're a Roman. And today, a one ounce gold coin can buy you a finely made suit today. So a one ounce gold coin is buying you a good suit of clothes 2,000 years ago and today. Um, very true. But the one thing that doesn't logically make sense to me, and again, I'm ignorant. I will fully ad admit that, freely admit that. What do they do? Okay, World Economic Forum. Um, uh, what is it, Blackwater or whatever, the, the big investment thing. Um, okay, they come and they take everything. Then what? Uh, I know from this area up here, northern Maine, a lot of houses are just really should be bulldozed, you know, quite frankly. They're not worth fixing up. People are trying to get these insane prices for these places, you know. Tax assessed at $50,000 and they're trying to get $500,000. Not, I'm not joking. You know, there's one not far from here, a couple miles down the road that's basically in that exact thing. I think 53,000 tax assessed and they're trying to get $489,000. Yeah, okay. Uh, you confiscate it. It's bank foreclosed. We took it. The money system collapsed and whatever else. It's financed by debt. We'll take it. Got a bunch of trucks up here, people driving around these trucks and they're, sounds like the, you know, bearings are going out in the wheels and the brakes are shot and whatever. <laughs> going down the road clanking and you know and you're going to go and take that because the people don't have it paid off okay what do you do with it you're mr banker mr one percent banker um i've taken all of the debt of the state of maine just to keep this thing simple you could say all of america all over the world whatever but let's just say the state of maine now i have you know 
however many, one million households or something under my house is under my authority and, and I have, you know, two million vehicles. And who are you going to sell it to? What's the point? Well, I'll just hold on to it all and I'll force the people to leave. Where are they going to go? But we'll have work camps and slave labor camps, you know, debtor prisons and things, which I think could be another part of it. I know Michael Burry, the big investment guy, he's been in investing his money into private prisons and whatever, which could become debtor prisons. That's another possibility. If you're in debt and they come and take it, what are they going to do with you? Uh, you go to a debtor prison. They were legal in America in the 19th century. They're not anymore. They, they banned them, but they could come back. I could see that happening. Better get out of debt. But uh, that would be my one thing, my one question. Okay, they confiscate everything, the great taking. Then what? What do they do with it? And I mean, something has to be done. Something has to occur because you can't just have people continuing to borrow and borrow and not pay again. Uh, the Bible condemns that. God's going to put an end to that. So um, would I recommend the book? Yeah, there's a few profanity words in it. I hate profanity, being a Christian with the Holy Spirit of God dwelling in me. Um, is there some good information? Absolutely, beyond a shadow of a doubt, yes. Some very good information. Uh, is it going to happen exactly like this? I don't know. I really don't know what's going to happen. But uh, pretty crazy stuff. Um, I believe the end game is what the Bible teaches about the book of Revelation where you have the mark of the beast that controls people's buying and selling and their worship and their life, basically. And um, you say, wow, this world with people taking the mark of the beast. Uh, friend, it's not going to be the same. Not anywhere even close to being the same as what we have lived with for the last 100 years. Uh, that's going to change. Everything will change. In order for them to be able to attain to this worship of the image of the beast and the whole cashless system and whatever, it's going to have to go to compact cities. I will tell you right now, 100% sure word of prophecy because it's based upon the scriptures, not because I've seen some vision or something. No, it's based upon the scriptures. The only way for the Mark of the Beast system to work, for them to truly implement it, will be compact cities. Cities where the people are able to walk around in a virtual reality and they have money and tokens and things coming in and they will worship the beast and his image. Um, and they can be controlled in basically prisons called cities. And uh, the Antichrist goes out and he hunts down the saints in the future. Not Christians, but saints in the time of Jacob's trouble. Big difference there. Because the saints in the time of Jacob's trouble can lose their salvation. Christians today cannot lose their salvation. Again, another big study there. But Revelation chapter 14, verses 9 through 12, proves that a saint in the time of Jacob's trouble can lose their salvation. Okay, If any man takes the mark worships the beast in his image. He gets God's wrath. Um, <clears throat> and there's the faith of Jesus and keeping the commandments in Revelation 14, verse 12. But if you go to Ephesians chapter 1 and Ephesians chapter 4, Christians are sealed with the Holy Spirit of promise until the day of redemption. Okay, it's sealing until the day of redemption, not until sometime in the future we don't really know. The day of redemption is the resurrection, when God redeems the dead and the living Christians from the earth and takes them up. So a Christian is sealed until the day of redemption. A tribulation saint, or time of Jacob's trouble saint, more properly called, they're not sealed. They have no promise of eternal life. They have to endure to the end to be saved. Please watch my studies. Huge amounts of scripture go into this whole thing. It isn't something that you're just going to get from a five-minute video or something like that. Uh, don't be like the people that don't endure the sound doctrine. So, um... Please, if you are in debt, do what you can to pay down your debts as quickly as possible. Try to get out of debt. Try to get physical assets, things that you can keep um, outside of the bank because the bank's just going to spend your money. Um, don't have huge amounts of money in the bank. Again, the FDIC, it's FDIC insured, brother. No, it's not. Okay, that's there. They have about 1.5% of depositor, American depositor money. FDIC could cover about 1.5%, I think is the number of that. If, if the whole banking system collapses at one time, they would only be able to cover one and a half percent. And you know who that would be, you know, whose money would be, they would cover. It wouldn't be yours, okay, or mine. So, um, 
just wanted to do a little video on this whole thing here. I realize it probably went longer than just a little video, but it's something that's very important, uh, extremely important. And um, we have to deal with money. We can't just say that uh, as Christians we aren't going to care about money or whatever else. It's, it's there. This ministry needs money to continue to run. You need ministry to, or you need a, you do need ministry, but uh, you need money to buy your food and to pay your bills and whatever else. Money is just one of the realities of this world. Don't get covetous. Don't buy things that you can't afford. Don't get yourself drown, drowning in debt. But make sure that you're providing for your own. So that is going to be it. Um, and we'll see everybody up in, in future videos. Thank you very much for watching. King James Video Ministries has been faithfully preaching and teaching from God's Word since 2008. Our YouTube channel has never been monetized and we do not accept money from the lost world because this would violate the scriptures. King James Video Ministries is supported by saved brethren in accordance with 1 Timothy chapter 5 verses 17 through 18. If you have been blessed by our videos, we would ask that you prayerfully consider supporting this ministry financially. You can donate online by visiting www.kingjamesvideoministries.com or by sending a check or money order to King James Video Ministries, P.O. Box 214, Patton, Maine, 04765. Thank you to all who donate to this ministry, and we pray for the Lord's blessing in your lives.